his own particular brand of humour, that brilliant young man of the theatre, Stephen Fry. The letter. The day the letter arrived, I was due in court on an intricate and puzzling case which was coming to a delicate and potentially explosive stage. The letter then came as a welcome diversion and I tipped the delivery boy out of the window with more than ordinary generosity. <laughs> I fancy I gave a momentary shudder as I unfolded the letter, but it was a cold morning and in accordance with Mr. Tulkinghorn's instructions with regard to the case I was engaged upon, I was naked. The letter read as follows. If Mr. John Lawson Particle will travel immediately to Transylvania as the honored guest of Count Dracula to personally advise His Excellency on a matter of great legal delicacy, Mr. Lawson Particle will be handsomely remunerated. He is to bring on his journey no garlic, no crucifixes, no wooden stakes. <laughs> Neither is he to look up in a dictionary the word vampire. <laughs> it seemed innocent enough. <laughs> Excited at the prospect of escaping a dreary London August, I rushed into Mr. Tulkinghorn's office. He read the letter through and eyed me carefully. You don't find anything strange in this letter, Mr. Lawson Particle? Ah, you noticed it too, sir. The split infinitive in the first sentence, yes. <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking, never mind. What case are you working on at the moment? I'm retained in the case of the London Rubber Company versus the Vatican, sir. <laughs> well, I dare say you can be spared. Um, as to the letter, you plan to go on this, Swiss, this fascinating mission? With your permission, sir, I will go straight home, dress and take the first train to Southampton. Four days later, saw me standing at the gates of Castle Dracula, weary and travel-stained. Prudence had demanded that I leave her behind, so I was alone. <laughs> the journey through Eastern Europe had passed pleasantly enough, however. I'd picked up a little German on a previous visit, and he and I had met up again at Regensburg. <laughs> Now, night was just falling as I knocked on the mighty oaken door and heard the answering echoes ring through the castle. After what seemed a cliché, iron bolts were drawn back, the portal swung open, and Count Dracula's manservant stood before me. Of all the hideous spectacles I have ever beheld, those perched on the end of this man's nose... <laughs> ...remain forever pasted into the album of my memory. Bowing low, this loathsomely disfigured wretch introduced himself. Travolta, sir. <laughs> At your servile. If you will follow me, I shall tell the master you have arrived. Walking with a pronounced limp, L-I-M-P, pronounced limp. He showed me into a waiting room, sorry, into a waiting room, and vanished. <laughs> Presently, he returned with his master. Ah, Mr. Lawson Particle, welcome to Castle Dracula. Dinner is in half an hour. Travolta will show you to your room. Tell me, what blood type are you? <laughs> A. I said, what blood type are you? <laughs> oh, I said, B. <laughs> I tried to question Travolta as to the nature of the Count's business as I dressed for dinner, but he made the sign of the cross and said nothing. I asked him why there were no mirrors of the, in the castle, but this time he made the sign of the very cross indeed and spat. <laughs> this was puzzling. I couldn't see myself spending a month in a house without mirrors. <laughs> the man was either mad or both. <laughs> Capon for dinner, sir, said Travolta as we descended the vast stairway. Capon, yummy, I replied. No, sir, the Count always insists that his guests put a cape on for dinner. <laughs> and what a dismal repast it was. My client was not eating, his diet forbade it. 
Instead, he quaffed greedily at a goblet of his tonic, a thick red liquid, which reminded me forcibly of some kind of wine. Travolta stood at my shoulder with a bottle of the liquid. Mac on, sir? What, on top of this cape? I'll suffocate. <laughs> I passed a fitful night in my vast bedroom. Below me, I could hear the Count's footsteps echoing in the hallway. The wind whistled all through the night and other Welsh hymns. <laughs> I arose early, made my toilet, sat on it, and then came down to breakfast. <laughs> Travolta informed me that his master had gone to bed at dawn and that he would expect me in his study later that evening. It was a dreary morning. The greatest excitement I had to look forward to was the prospect of a total eclipse of the sun, which was expected during the afternoon. I whiled away the morning hours in the Count's garden. The only note of beauty or hope in this melancholy wilderness came from the flowers. I stooped to pick a buttercup. Why people leave buttocks lying around, I've no idea. <laughs> When the time for the eclipse came, I watched through a fragment of smoked glass as the moon slid slowly over the surface of the sun and darkness shrouded the earth. I started at a sound behind me. By the dim light of a candle I had prudently placed on the table, I could see that it was Count Dracula, my client. He seemed a little excited. A tendril of spaghetti appeared to be protruding from either side of his mouth. <laughs> Why, good afternoon, Count, I cried. I wasn't expecting you until this evening. Have you come to enjoy the spectacle? Spectacle? The solar eclipse. He looked out of the window. Solar eclipse? Yes, it's the first total eclipse I've ever seen. Exciting, isn't it? Oh, bother. <laughs> is there something wrong, Count? You look a little unwell. How much longer is it going to last, he cried, and I could see fear in his blood-red eyes. Well, it's just ending now, I replied. Look at that, splendid, isn't it? I turned in time to watch the moon moving slowly away from the sun, and light once more flooding the scene. Have you ever seen anything so... Oh, Count? But he had disappeared, leaving his cape behind him. In his hurry, he must have upset the ashtray on the floor beside it. <laughs> I never saw him again. Well-deserved acclaim for Stephen Fry there for his marvellous piece entitled The Left.